I'll kick off with the fluids update. You'll notice that we're covering essentially four releases, so we have a, a lot of stuff to get through. Boy, is there some good stuff coming up, or available, actually. You should all be moving on to this right now. So let's talk about making things easier to do. So one of the things you're going to see is that Fluent has got this new interface that's gradually come in, um, much, much cleaner and modern and flexible. You can actually save preferences. And look, it looks like mechanical. It looks like the electronics interfaces. So we've really got a common interface coming across our software. Um, nice workflow now. So we're aiming for this single window workflow. So we've got a geometry here, sound in space claim. Let's take it across into Fluent and surface mesh it. You'll notice we haven't extracted the geometry yet, the flow geometry. We've got the metal. So we'll do some capping and then we'll get a volume mesh. And here you'll see a mosaic mesh. We'll talk about those later. Um, set it up, solve it, do our post-processing. And if we want to, all that could be done in, in Workbench, as long as you've moved to 2019 R2. So this is making things much, much easier as a workflow. And um, <coughs> what is the aim of this? We have an incredibly powerful mesher in um, the fluent meshing, but it's not easy to use. You, you need to be quite a guru to use it. But what happens if you embed best practices like they've done here in some templates and make those templates customizable? We can record and replay workflows, make changes. We can move a geometry in and out and then quickly make the same mesh. So this is really a revolution in meshing that we've got here. The, each release is giving us more and more features. Just to mention a couple of the more recent ones, much more control over sizing, axisymmetric, so rotational periodicity. We've got now parallel meshing when we're using mosaic meshing. So mosaic is the hex polys. When we connect a hex mesh to prisms via polyhedra, and you're going to see some many more examples of this as I, as I progress. Um, and it's got really easy field sensitive help now. So if you don't use it much, you can hover and get help, and um, that's going to help you a lot. Um, why mosaic? Because the meshes you get look like a mosaic. So what we're seeing here is you've got this nice inflation mesh everywhere. Um, previously, when you did a hex core, that was connected via TETS. And if the code was going to blow up, that's where the bad results would be. So now they are connected by polyhedra. And the quality of the meshes you can make because of that is vastly improved. Um, you can enable, enable parallel meshing from this. You don't need licensing for that. It will just use how many cores you've told it when you launch Fluent. So you can see here as well, if I point there, you can get help at lots of places. Just click on there, and you can get some local help. Um, that geometry is for nice, clean geometry. So where you've got either a nicely defined fluid region already, because many people doing fluids will just make a fluid region, or you've got clean CAD. But we know that many of our customers have extremely dirty, horrible CAD. And the only way you're going to be able to deal with that is to be able to wrap it. So imagine the ultimate in that is dealing with a car and underbody, um, under, under hood cooling and things. So what you need here now is a template where you can wrap and, and control the degree of refinement of that wrapping. You can deal with leak detection, et cetera. Um, you might have some special features there. This release has been particularly done for, for car meshing. There'll be others coming. So you can actually pull out a region and tell it you want it to be a porous media for a heat exchanger. You can pick on a wheel area and tell it you want to put a rotating frame of reference in there. And then a really nice one is that you can use the shape of a body like your car to pull out some shapes 
around it that you want to use for uh, mesh refinement and then you can drag them back at the back here and extend them backwards to get a wake region so you can progressively have some nice refinement on there without having to work very hard to do it. So this workflow has just come out in R2 in, in final form um, and it's, it's looking really, really promising. For those of you who've got overlapping solids, holes, faults, too much detail that you need to clean up. Um, moving on to other fares, turbo tools. We, we all know ANSYS has got extremely good meshing for turbo machinery. Um, the nice feature that I really want to highlight here is now when you've got, for example, a return channel, which is going to be really, really hard to get a hex mesh on, you can build that into a turbo grid session now and have uh, conformal mesh joins here and a good quality um, tetrahedral mesh through there. Expressions influent. How many people have wanted this for so long? Yeah. So what this is going to enable you to do now is to start writing expressions just as you did in CFX. You can see down here that you've got an expression area where you can generate expressions. Um, you can generate them here and use them, or you can generate them in sight here. It's very, very similar to the CFX expressions. There's some modifications. It's more flexible with the way you can address surfaces, etc. You can write them out to a file, and the age-old problem of wanting to be able to keep a comment against each expression is now resolved. So where can you use them at the moment? Boundary conditions, zone conditions. Okay, we can't use them throughout Fluent yet, but it's coming. Um, so watch this space. Um, but I think there's already sufficient there that you'll find them really, really useful. Um, flexible mesh adaption. More and more people wanted to adaption. Put the mesh where you need it. The previous Fluent methodology was a bit cumbersome. Um, lots and lots of panels and boxes, easy to get lost. That's been massively streamlined. It's also been improved so that you can specify buffer layers. So when you refine somewhere, make it refine out to the base background mesh more slowly so that you actually get a smoother transition there. Um, this is one of my particular favorites. When you're running a steady state, you often don't get convergence because there's transient flow. You can now use transient statistics on a steady state. And I'm going to demo that later. So lots of other things around meshes, etc. So the overset meshing has had improvements mostly around robustness and improving the overlap detection. For those of you who've got moving bodies, we've had this six degree of freedom solver where you've got three translational, three rotational, you can now use a one degree of uh, freedom solver, which is going to be faster, easier to set up if that's what you've got. Adaption and smoothing started to do some work in this area. It's a big area at the moment for ongoing releases. So we've got a very nice um, adaption method in Puma, which can adapt on polyhedral cells. You've got more control over that now. You can actually um, set a minimum cell quality. And there's improved stabilization. If you're doing uh, mesh smoothing with the elastic model, we've now got a better solver in that, so that that's going to be much more robust. Watch this space. Adaption, smoothing, remeshing are topics undergoing significant work for the next release. Um, there's a couple of new ways of setting up time stepping. So this is, this is nothing magic, but it's an example of the usability that's coming into Fluent. Um, something we're used to, used to seeing in CFX and wanting to see here. So there's a couple of areas. One is when you've got rotating. You've got a mixing vessel, for example. You can give a period, the number of time steps you want per period, the number of periods you want to run, and off it will go and populate the rest for you. So you've got flexibility how you set that up and Courant-based time-stepping. So you've got some nice impacting shock here. You've even got an unstable shear layer in there. And this is now all being, um, time-steps all being controlled automatically based on the Courant number. So 
That's a, a nice ease of use facility there. We talked about remote visualization. Many, many, poor pe many, many more people are needing to run jobs on a cluster because they're doing bigger jobs, um, particularly unsteady turbulence, etc. So we showed in a, in a previous release how you could interact with those jobs while they were running. Well, that's undergone um, more extensions. You can actually send more commands through from the remote visualization client. It's all scripted in Python. So um, have a look at that if you're using those type of um, simulations. Also, when you're running across a load manager now, we've really cleaned up how you set up Fluent and what, what commands you give it to send things off to a scheduler and what options you want. So it's made it easier. Um, some of the old commands are being kicked out to make it actually easier to use. Um, adjoints. So adjoint solver is about solving a problem and then asking the question, what, how could I achieve a better objective here? That could be, can I reduce the drag? Can I get more lift? Can I reduce the total pressure loss in my ducting? And how do I do that by varying either boundary conditions or boundary surfaces? So I then run an adjoint solution, which is going to cost me about the same time. And then I can start um, seeing what direction I have to move things. Now, one of the problems with that has been that um, it can be a bit tedious to get solutions. They've got new solution methods. And based on that, a couple of the older ones have been dropped out of the GUI. There's more observables. There's better. You can now use the least squares cell gradient, so more accuracy. So gradually, more and more features are being pushed into this. It's used very extensively in design overseas for, for car components, for um, it could be used for domestic appliance components, everything. There's lots and lots of uses for it. Um, and then they've also got a more traditional mesh-based optimization tool. They've done quite a bit of work this time to improve it for the specific area of pipe work. So if you use that, come and ask us some questions. So what we also want to do is make the software more robust. Okay, um, It's nice to be able to do things easily, but you want the answers. You want them reliably. So there's been some, some significant improvements here. So the first of these is improving the hybrid initialization. We know that there were quite a few cases in the past where, for example, you could end up with some unphysical wiggles near an inlet or an outlet, and that could give you problems when you started the simulation. So all of those issues have been fixed. Um, they've made the scaling of the residuals when you solve this consistent with what you choose. Because if you remember, what we're doing here is we're solving a potential flow problem. So we're kicking off um, the solution with a potential flow problem. And I'm going to show you that later in part of the demo. Um, we should really let our solver team get out of the dark cupboard more often because they're showing all their pictures in the traditional GUI. Um, but there's some really important messages on this quite dull slide. Um, so the first one is if you're running any sort of steady state simulation in Fluent, you will now automatically be directed to the coupled solver, pseudo transient, and that works on a GPU. So that's something I'm going to show in a moment. So that's really the same defaults as you would have in CFX, except we can use a GPU. And we can use the GPU to solve the linearized equations. That really uh, speeds things up. We talked last time about improvements to the multigrid. Those have become so much better and so useful that a lot of this is now incorporated by default. So when you, um, when you use some of the pseudo-transient solvers and that, all of these new coupled multigrid improvements have gone in. And finally, there's been improvements for use on non-uniform meshes. Despite all the efforts to get nice, smooth meshes, there's still often regions which are not so good. Um, we've now got an improved reach out algorithm for dealing with that, especially for, for hex core meshes. Boundary conditions, one big slide for one little tick, <coughs> but it's an important one. Users have wanted to be able to prevent reverse flow at inlets. So 
we've got an inlet pressure boundary here, we can, we can stop uh, reverse flow. If you're a multi-phase flow user, then there's lots and lots of work that's gone into this. Um, we'll talk more later about non-iterative solvers. So this is when you're running a transient and you're not doing massive numbers of iterations at each time step, but you're actually um, using a fractional step method or similar to do one iteration and move forward. That's been pretty solid for <coughs> single phase flows for quite a while. The, the multi-phase version is a lot more stable now, a lot better defaults. We've got a new option to go to body force weighting for the pressure distribution. And that's, if you're doing anything um, with significant density differences, then that's gonna make a big difference in your simulations. And we've got some improvements to Presto. But um, you can see here an example where it's non-converge, and now we've come to converge. So switching across to that body weighted differencing. Radiation, now this, is, this module is used across CFX and, and Fluent. Um, in Fluent, you couldn't really target very well how you controlled the subgrouping of cells to make a radiation mesh. You can do that more easily now with a simple option in here. You can now use this Monte Carlo model with the mapped mesh interface and with solar loads. And for both CFX and, and Fluent, there are performance improvements and bug fixes. So um, if you're using that, that's good. So at this point, I want to have a break from talking and do a demo. So I've got, just got Space Claim open. Quickly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my old favorite, the Valve demo. I'm going to drag and drop my assembly on there. So um, we're going to use a different meshing technique than that. But I like to start here because I want to show you some alternative workflows. So previously, you would have always seen me go and use a fill to get this um, done. What I'm going to do here quickly is just go to groups and name a couple of surfaces. Now, I don't have to, but it will just make life really fast when I, when I go to the next step. I'm going to pick these two. Now, I don't need to do any cleanup of this, but I just want to kind of remind you, because very, very few users actually use the full power of this. So if I go to a workbench here now, I can look for things like split edges. Oh, there aren't any. Extra edges. Yep. If I drag this down, we've got lots of edge, extra edges. So let's lose them. Um, we might want to uh, simplify nothing to simplify, etc. We can work through this. Now, if we're going to go and use the, the watertight template for this, it's really important that we share topology. Now, we can do that within the um, app, but the share topology in, in uh, space claim is better. So we hit the shared topology here. So where my plunger goes into the valve body, I need to share that topology. So that's done, and if I click back on my structure here, I can see it's shared because it will have a little sign showing it. And I can see here that I've got a shared edge. I'm just not seeing that here now. Let me just check this again. So share, yep, must be okay. Now, these are new tools that we can go here. So if we go through into Fluent here now, we're going to choose the watertight geometry. And so I need to save this. So let's just save it on the desktop. That'll do. And Fluent's going to open for me. So I'm in meshing mode. But what's new in meshing mode is that um, I've got myself a template all set here, or will have. So I now have a, um, a workflow that I just have to follow. So the first thing it's going to do is assume that because I connected to this, this is the geometry I want. So it's brought it in. Um, I can add local sizings, body of influence, etc., but I don't want to. I'm just going to use the defaults. So let's see how well it can do with defaults. Okay, let's, let's make that slightly bigger. 
and maybe let's just bring that to say uh, 0.25 and curvature looks good we've got proximity all the usual tools so let's knock out a, say, a surface mesh so wham done let's toggle back to the console surface mesh this has got a maximum skewness of 0.47 so it's a really high quality mesh now we'll jump back here geometry consists of only solid regions that's true isn't it um, will we want to cap yes we do we don't have any internal boundaries we don't want to share topology because we've done it so now it's asking us to make a cap so I'll pick that one so if I sorry if I if I just so it's picked that face I could have picked it here by clicking on it um, I'm just going to give it a name and create that cap Nice thing is I'm creating boundary conditions as I go, and that's going to tell the mesher as well what's a wall and what isn't. So I'm going to need that one out. Um, I want to make that a pressure outlet. So I'm going to call that out, outlet, oops, typing. Um, let's do that. Create a region. I think there should only be one internal region. Yep. Now, if I go ahead now, I can have it mesh everything. So if I want to do a conjugate heat transfer problem, I can have a mesh on that. But if I don't, I'm just going to tell it that these bodies are going to be dead from now on. Update that. And yeah, let's just drop that cell size back to five where we had it before. Create a mesh. And this is going to go off and put me, ah, this is going to put me a polyhedral mesh on. We're going to do a couple of different meshes. Okay, so it's done. So we've got a polyhedral mesh. Let's quickly toggle across here, the quality. It's, it's, it's aimed for point 0.2 and it's got it. So suppose I go back to here and wanted to actually make a polyhex core. I can edit. Choose polyhex core. You can see there's some advanced options here. That I can tick. I can also make this uh, run in parallel. Um, so this is going to quickly um, go through again. So it bings away a bit as it brings up these windows. Okay, so we've got a quite a nice looking polyhex core there. So um, you'll notice it's got hanging nodes. That's the core of it. You'll also see here that these don't extend out to the boundaries. That's something that's work in progress to not have polyhedra on the exit. But it does really good inflation. You would never have seen inflation in that top corner of my, oops, top corner of my, I'm making a micro dot here so you can't see it. Um, top corner there, so good. So let's just quickly look at the console. That was point two. Oh, I don't like that. That's not good enough. So I can insert a task, improve the volume mesh. Okay, so let's make it 0.4 and see whether we can go there for orthogonal quality. So it's going to just do that. Yep, it's done it already. So why do I care about such quality meshes? Okay, first people think, oh, if I, if I can get it good enough, I'll get a solution. There's two things wrong with that. If the mesh isn't good enough, then I might not get a solution. I might find it hard to, do, uh, to solve. But secondly, it's going to take me a lot, lot longer to solve. So these few minutes we spend up front getting a really nice quality mesh are really going to pay dividends later. Um, if I were outside here, I could click on here now and save this template. Because I'm in Workbench, I don't need to bother because it's going to do it. Or, sorry, because I'm in this workflow, um, here, sorry, I forgot I wasn't in Workbench. I can just save a template here. I toyed up with which to show you, Workbench or, or out, and I'll do it doing it outside. Um, okay, so I've got that ready to go. You'll notice it only is showing up the surface mesh now. Whenever I want to see the cut, full mesh. It's easy to do, but I'm, I'm ready to go. Switch across to Fluent, yep. It's a one-way transfer at the moment, but it won't be. Um, soon we'll be able to go backwards and forwards there. So let's just quickly check the mesh quality. 
Oh, I didn't hit it, I don't think. Yep, 0.4. So we've got this toolbar along the top that we're going we're gonna to work through to set things up. I don't need to do anything more with the mesh physics. Um, I'd like to change my turbulence model. So I'm going to use a new one. I'm going to use Gecko. We haven't spoken about Gecko yet, but you'll notice there's a few interesting new constants here, and I'll be explaining that a bit later. I'm going to put curvature correction on because I get sw swirl in my valve. Um, I'd like to use water. So I'm going to go to the Fluent Database. I'm going to go right to the end and pull out water. Copy, close. Now, many people make this mistake. They go and copy water in, but unless you actually do something with it, it doesn't get used. So we're going to put it there. I can, I can say, give myself a new name so it's easier. Now, I'd like to put in a fully developed flow coming into this. So am I going to write a user-defined function and, and you can watch me struggle while I compile it? No. What I'm going to do is go to the named expressions. I'm going to import from file. I've got a little file that does this. So it's pulled in my list of expressions that I've got. Let me just show you so you know what the syntax is. So, um, for example, the radius is just the maximum of y over the region inlet. There's a slightly different syntax here for addressing surfaces because I can put commas here and use multiple surfaces in the same command. And so my umax, sorry, umax is not interesting, it's just a number, um, is umax times the max of 1 minus r. I've got a zero in there to stop this going negative if there's a slight truncation error, and a 1 over a power. So I can choose between a seventh or a ninth. Now, how do I use it? I go to my inlet. And this is going to be very familiar to the CFX guys, uh, that you go to expressions, a little FX comes up, and we can type, and it will auto-recognize as soon as we get somewhere. So you. I think that's all I want to do on the setup. Methods. All looks good. Coupled solver, it's, it's the defaults you'd expect. Let's make a definition. So let's create a new definition, which is a surface plot, which is I'm going to use a total pressure difference on this. So on a mass weighted average of total pressure on the... Now, if I take the inlet and the outlet, it'll just add them together. And I can tell that to make myself a report plot. And I'm going to call that P drop for the pressure drop, okay? Why aren't I using pressure here for pressure drop? Because I've got two different areas of my pipes. Monitors, residuals, you need to go down here to click local, local scaling, and then it looks like CFX. Let's initialize. So it's gonna whip through and do this initialization. Okay, let's have a look and see what a potential flow looks like. So I'm going to go to the graphics, mesh, new. I just want the faces. I want it on just the walls. And I'm going to choose a color that I, I like, like gray. OK, so I've got that. I now need to make some path lines. So let's start some path lines from the inlet. And let's color them with the velocity. Okay, now let's use the scene option to give this some context. A new mesh. So that's what potential flow through the valve looks like. It's really quite interesting, isn't it, how smooth that is? So if we didn't have viscosity, we'd have a really nice valve here. Um, that's only in academia where we can put viscosity equals zero. Right, let's save this. Now, I, I could just run here, but I actually want to write the case and data so that I can go back and change some things in the setup. Because at the moment, if you launch 
directly from Workbench, there's not an option to, to choose um, how, ma how many processes you use. How am I going for time? That's good. Um, so I'm going to start Fluent again. Um, this time I want to go on all four, and I want to go on my GPU. Oops, and I want to go to my desktop, and OK. So, whilst that is um, opening up, I'll get ready to just read in my setup. I've got the ACT loaded. I'm going to show you how in a second that makes it easy to send stuff off to um, the cloud. So let's read, once this is, once this is running, I will um, show you the setup for the cloud. So let's drag that across. So all I need to do is come in here and run this. Now, I can do better than using the automatic time step because Anybody who's used the effects is experienced at getting a good time step. Uh, let's run a run a solution. Let's see what's going to happen here. Let it go. Yep. While it's doing that, I'll just slide across here, um, launch the wizard, Ansys Cloud. So this is the pressure drop updating. Now, I'm not going to be able to uh, do anything here because I haven't got the haven't got the internet connected, but I'll just show you what would happen. Okay, it's unavailable, oh, so it goes down. Uh, let me just do it again and leave that thing up. I took the internet off because I was having licensing issues with it on. So you can see a couple of red dots there. Those would go green. I'd type on new job, and that would look exactly what Luke showed in the movie. You'd pick a name. You'd pick which file you want to send. You'd choose which server you want to go to, etc. So, let's get rid of that. Look, this has started to flatten out. What are the residuals done? They haven't, don't look so smart. Um, this almost certainly is transient. So previously, I would have no easy way of finding out where in this flow is it transient. So I'm going to just quickly switch on sampling. And now we can quickly do that. So we're going to run a few more iterations, collect some sampling data. Let me close that off, and then you'll have a bigger space to view. Oh, it won't let me do it until this is finished. I don't need that much data, so I can stop. You'll notice this stop bar is now integrated. Um, so we've, we've sort of got a good idea of this, but it's moving around. So let's go and have a look first at our scene. So that's what happens when we have real flow. Look how complex it is. We've had separation off that edge. We've got some strong separation there. And I'm sure if I look in there, you can see there's some pretty strong vortices here. Those vortices can't sit still in a geometry like this. It's just impossible if you're solving it on an accurate solver. Um, let's now go and plot a few things. So what we'd like to do here, let me click on let me move this across. I'd like to click on the. Oh, I'd like to go and click on my plane. Yep. So when I click there, I've now got a surface option here. I don't have to go up to the toolbar anymore. A new plane. And I'm going to align it with the view plane. Create. Close. So let's do a new contour. Let's pick that plane. So we could do all the usual stuff. Well, that's what the pressure looks like. So we've got a strong stagnation pressure, some low pressures in this recirculation. But let's go down and look at our steady statistics. So first of all, I can look at my uh, mean velocity magnitude. You can see here I've got a profile for my 1 7th power law. Now, this looks complex. There's lots of regions of low flow, which tells me there must be separations. Now I can look at my RMS. So these are the big regions where things are happening. So these vortices are not steady here, and they're varying by, you know, up to about 1.9 meters a second. And my mean velocity 
is around nine. So I really do need to take this to a transient flow now. Um, but that's just showing you a few of those new features that we've got. We'll quickly jump back to that and jump back to the presentation because I better not be over time today. We've got the boss here. Um, so, demo over. Let's make some things faster to do. So this is a study by my colleague Hashan who is looking at just flow around some buildings. And I just want to show you um, polyhedral hex core versus tetrahedral. They look very similar results. Um, they look very similar in terms of streamlines. And you can go and do quantitative numbers, and they do. But look at the difference. So we've got four simulations. He's um, kept the same mesh settings. So C he's taken the mesh into CFX and use that tetra tetrahedral. And this is the time to do 200 iterations. So CFX and Fluent, there's really not much to, difference to choose between them. Fluent polyhedral goes down again. Fluent polyhex core, um, computational time goes down again. And then memory requirements. Again, CFX and Fluent with a tet mesh, not much to choose. Polyhedral down to polyhex core. So if you've got limited requirements, sorry, limited resources, you could do a polyhex core with twice as many cells, and if you want a fixed requirement, or you could reduce your time. So this is a really nice example um, of, of the differences we can get and how we can speed up with meshing. Don't even take into account the difference in time it would take to mesh between workbench and fluent meshing, or for this new template. It is enormous. It's so, so much quicker and easier. Other performance improvements, so improved load balancing for conjugate heat transfer problems, problems with sliding meshes, and problems with particles. So the usual things, they're working on parallel. Okay, this is, this is a really big one for anybody who's doing scale resolve simulations. We can improve a couple of ways in how we speed up. We, if we go to the non-iterative solver, we're going to speed up quite a lot. We can also accelerate that time marching if we don't have very stretched cells. So we're not really in like a, um, an external aero boundary layer with a Y plus one mesh. We're more into to something with a more reasonable set of, um, of aspect ratios. We can switch on this accelerated time marching and we get a 5.8 speed up. If we've got things where we've got density differences, like combustion, but density differences in general, there's ways we can flip the order of equations round and get another two times speed up. So lots and lots of work on speed up. This is another really good one. If you're using something like this, uh, the stress blended eddy simulation, because you want to capture uh, the turbulent structure, but we need a RANS model at the walls. Until now, we've had to uh, um, advance them with the same time step. But why are we advancing the wall behavior at the same um, frequency when it's really much more stable there? We don't need that. So in this case, by having doing that only every fifth iteration, you get another 25% speed up. ANSYS have done it at even at 10, well, it's every 10 iterations, and still get very similar results. And you get about a 40% speed up then. So there's some really good stuff there. If anybody's doing blade cooling or any, any task where they've got lots of small inlets, you no longer need to use the point sources in CFX. You can use this new methodology for mapping inlets. And there's lots of new options, so blade cooling in particular. If you're doing anything with turbo, um, although it's not restricted to turbo, its primary aim is that, um, you want to set up a whole load of runs to give you essentially a fan curve or a pump curve at different speed lines, then there's a very easy way to set all those jobs up and get them running and bring back just the data you need, build your plots and that automatically for you. If you're using, remember we've talked about how we can model sprays in detail. And if you're using that VOF to DPM model, then this was where we modeled the detail of a jet breaking up. And when 
the droplets broke up, they would form a discrete particle model and they would be tracked with that. The problem is that that's not really going to a true DPM because every droplet is being tracked. There's now a tool where you can stop the simulation, pull all those out and replace them with um, like clouds of particles that you've, you've put in with relevant size distributions, etc. So it's, it's massive speed up. And it's all done within a nice tool within the GUI. And you can use that also for, for doing sampling and that on your data when you're using DPM. Cloud, we're not going to mention more here other than that, look, we can, we can even do quick looks at what's going on on our phone. Um, we've got certain packages for CFD, small, medium, and large, so they pretty well cover any sort of job you might want to do. Uh, new technology, Gecko. This is a game changer in RAN's turbulence modeling. So if I ask you what your favorite turbulence model was and went around this room, everybody would have a different favorite. Oh, I've got to use RNG. No, 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 it's got, to be, it's got to be realizable. No, 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 I use SST. So every one of those models gets carried along in the code. And really, people have forgotten why they like a particular model now. So the idea here is, can we take all the best of all those models and bring them together? So what are the, why are we choosing one model over another? It's to do with the physics it captures. So key things you might want to capture are flow separation, spreading rates, um, transfer rates near walls, free jet. So when you've got the, the uh, round jet, square jet problem, corner vortices. Can't catch them with a two equation model. You've got to use something where you have an algebraic Reynolds stress model. And of course, if we don't have curvature correction, we can't get swirl properly. So bring all these together in a single model, which allows you to change a constant and only change one particular part of the physics. There's a really extensive validation manual on this. Um, and this has been picked up massively already by lots of ANSYS users who were testing it. Going forward, this is going to be a model that gets massive development. You can already hang on to it, all the physics that you might want to add, things like buoyancy effects, um, stagnation point corrections, all of those things will fit with this model. And just also, if you, if you need to generate turbulence, synthetic turbulence, um, to, to go into a, a scale resolving model, there's a new generator. And I just wanted to re-flag up here how this curvature correction term is so important when you've got rotating flows. You can get really good results with, say, SST and curvature correction without going to the horror of a full Reynolds stress model. Um, if you're doing complex turbo machinery where you want to look at flutter, um, damage blades, etc., CFX continues to power on having really world-leading models here. I won't dwell on this because I don't think we have any users here, but if you ever get into this area, that's where you should be. Um, new, new things for our separation, our wall models. So um, in the spray modeling here, we can have a spray hit a plate, form a Lagrangian wall film with a given thickness of that. When it gets to the edge of the plate, it will now peel off and go back to droplets. So we can recreate um, droplets as they're shed off. And here's a new breakup model for a jet in a cross flow. Erosion, we've been doing a lot of work in this area. So we've had particle erosion from impact. You can now have abrasive erosion and you can actually incorporate that with the moving mesh, change the shape of your pipe. You can allow the fact that if you've got particle erosion as well as abrasion, you get this shielding effect. If you're using particles, you can now get their pressure distribution, etc., of forces on the walls. Um, quite a few other multi-phase enhancements. They've really cleaned up the GUI to make it much clearer um, on many of these um, transfer models, things like evaporation, um, cavitation, etc. The GUI's changed. You've got um, improved inputting for tabular data. You can post-process more quantities like vapor pressures and latent heats, etc. Um, 
If you've got thin films, you can now deal with this partial wetting. So you can have some parameters in there that allow you to change the wettability. <coughs> CFX, you've got this equilibrium um, uh, uh, equilibrium um, cavitation model, which has no free parameters. It's thermodynamically based only. So that's gone in, and that's useful for pumps. Um, if you're doing any sort of chemical reactions, we've been integrating Chemkin's tools into Fluent. You can now generate flame libraries within Fluent that use the Chemkin technology. That means you get better flamelets. And what does that mean for your simulations? You can see here that you're getting, um, when you compare the finite rate chemistry, which is the full model, with the original flamelets, not so good, much, much better. So that's a big plus on that. Um, if you want to do anything where you've got um, some pre-mixing and thickened flames, or partial pre-mixing, you can see there's a light off here. There's a couple of little burners as hot um, fluid moves across and radicals cause ignition, you can now simulate that much better. If you do acoustics, we've been able to do computational acoustics, which is at the local point. Suppose you want to propagate within the fluid and keep more details. Well, that's very, very expensive because you've got to resolve that. Now um, we've got a new midfield solver that will do propagation essentially using the wave equation. And then you can tack that onto the far field solver if you want. So it's a good way of doing that intermediate um, sound propagation. System coupling. So we can now use polyhedra in system coupling. There's a way you can now change, you can have multiple faces connected to multiple faces. And there's also a new coupling um, setup that supports command line setup um, with Python. If you're doing system coupling, absolutely update to R2. There have been some really big improvements. I've seen two cases just in the last week that don't run properly in R1 that now solve beautifully in R2. Um, another form of coupling is when we want to link our electromagnetics. So particularly for things like motor design, We'd like to bring the temperature of the magnets across from a, a CFD simulation. That will go into Maxwell, which will change the performance and the losses. Those then go back into uh, Fluent. And you can iterate around that cycle and get that coupling and determine the correct performance. If you need to know anything about this, Jonathan's your person. He's been doing this for clients. Just a quick... Um, Discussion of a partner software. Uh, ANSYS couples really well. Fluent couples really well with Rocky. So if any of you have got particles, now I'm not looking at real particles here in terms of just ores and that like we used to. We're now looking at things like fibers. So here is a simulation of sucking up fibers and doing it. You can have thin shells, conveying of, of, of potato chips. So there's some really, really good physics Talk to any of the ANSYS guys here if you want to know more about that. And notice how you can link this into Workbench, too. Uh, Joel will be upstairs in the corner. So Joel will be stood in the corner. We'll um, make sure that you go and see him if you've got any um, rocky questions. We're getting towards the end, um, so because I've powered through it, so we've got plenty of time for the talks. Um, ROM Builder. So what's all this about? There are many complex things that require a lot of simulation time, but if you want to then build that into a system model, a digital twin, it's no, not sensible. You can't have uh, a model that's used for control that requires Fluent to run for three hours to get you a number. So what you have to do in this circumstances is you, you, you need the full physics to understand the problem, but you then want to parameterize that down into something that runs really quickly, and that can be done with what we've got called a twin builder. So let's imagine this piece of pipework here. And that could have all sorts of nasties going on in it. Cavitation, corrosion, erosion. 
got heat transfer through the system, and we want to capture some of those processes to know what's going on. So we can set up a model here, and particularly, you know, you can change a set of operation parameters that make sense. So here the key one is the pH probably, because we've got electrochemical reactions for corrosion there. So keep in mind we can do corrosion with influent. So we're going to set that problem up. And we're going to work through a set of runs and build up um, a database of output from there. And we're going to let the twin builder handle this. And then we're going to be able to use that twin builder, that, that, that simple ROM that is produced, to quickly get data. So this calculation with all the corrosion and that is taking about one hour per run on 12 CPUs. The ROM takes about two seconds, yet the difference is only a few percent. So you can see how important it is um, when you want to start using this data downstream in your products, in um, more detailed models of a system, you can bring the detail in without bringing in the massive run times that CFD is going to need, um, especially when you're doing things like electrochemistry. So um, there's a lot of work gone into that, 